So the final part of the lecture, we're going to look first at geothermal um, before looking at combined heat and power. So there's mixed messages about geothermal. Um, some places call them sustainable and renewable, and occasionally they can be, but most of the time it's an energy harvesting approach, taking heat from where it's naturally available, um, either in the, the depth of the earth or um, where the heat that comes from the center near some of the tectonic plates, you actually get uh, lava from um, down in the center coming up and that can be much hotter and heat rainwater that goes into aquifers and then you can use that for heating um, houses or hot water systems and so on. Now, naturally you have in the earth, the center of the earth is much hotter and is known to be at 4,000 degrees C and molten. It cools as you get close to the surface and there's this external crust that is between 30 to 50 kilometers deep. Now the outside part of the mantle, um, just underneath this crust is about 500 degrees C. And what you see as you go through the crust is that an average for every 100 meters depth you do, there's a three degree C increase in temperature. So if you can dig down and dig down far enough, what you'll find is that there is heat that you can use a heat pump to actually extract and, and use for energy. <clears throat> now, if you go deep enough, this is certainly a long-term sustainable process that can go on. But if you don't go deep enough, you'll see later that many of these systems can actually uh, have finite times where you can extract the heat energy that's local. And if there's no ability to get more heat into those systems, um, they only have a finite lifetime, you can use them. The other thing that I sort of spoke about earlier, there are certain radioactive rocks. So granite in particular, um, in the UK, if you go to Cornwall, but also if you go to um, the Cairngorms in Scotland, the rocks have radioactive materials in them. Some of this is typically radon gas and the radioactive decay processes can actually heat the rocks more than um, standard rocks around. So compared to sandstone, granite gives you much more heat. So that also is a way that there's more available heat you can extract and potentially use for heating. Now, if, if we look in a bit more detail, um, you know, the heat source we're talking about, it could be this diagram's got crystalline granite, but it might also be the case that this could be lava close to a volcano um, near one of the uh, tectonic plate boundaries. And what you're interested in is having an aquifer, all, all an aquifer is, is either soil or rock that is porous to water and the water can move through it. If you have impermeable rock above it, then you typically will find that water can easily heat up. You may even form steam if the heat source is hot enough. And what we're trying to do um, is look for where that is captured in a basin and be able to drill down and take the heat out of this water. Now, what you'll see in some parts of the world is you get hot springs, you might get geysers, fumaroles, um, and this is basically where you have naturally some uh, crack in the impermeable rock that the steam or the hot water can actually come up to the surface and get emitted. So you can see that this is not something you can use everywhere on the planet and in every country, and some countries have um, many more geothermal sources that can be used. Actually in Glasgow, there are a number of uh, geothermal sources from old mining wells. And basically people use the, the large depth to, to get a large temperature differential with ground source heat pumps. And there's a number of examples around Glasgow looking at that as, as more practical, long-term, low carbon heating solutions. So how much energy is available? Well, what we're going to do in the next couple of slides is derive 
how, how much energy is available. Now, in fact, what we're interested in is the aquifer down here. And we're going to have a length, a capital L. And we're going to put down some cold water at this T naught. So that's going to be typically a, a room temperature um, water going down. The water will flow through the aquifer, extract heat, and then we pull hot water out of the aquifer at some other point. This might be quite close to where the cold water goes in, but as you'll see, the longer the aquifer we have, the more heat energy we can get out. And so as you might expect, the distance between these two things, the longer you can make it or, or through the aquifer, um, the more important it is. Now, if you're just drilling directly uh, beneath you, these could be quite close together, but the length that we're talking about that is schematically horizontal here could also be vertically. Um, and so, you know, there's different geometries to use. This is just a schematic diagram to allow us to get an equation to calculate how much energy we can extract and the lifetime of, from an aquifer. The other thing we need in here is that the cold water is going to move through the hot aquifer and it's going to do that with a velocity, Vf for the velocity of the fluid. Um, so the distance is just the velocity times the time. The water's got a specific heat capacity, Cw, and a density, rho w. Now, the heat per unit volume of rock, well, if the rock density is rho r, and the rock specific heat capacity is Cr, then the heat per unit volume, so this is just your Q equals mc delta t, but um, heat per unit volume, it's going to be the density rather than the mass. So it's the density of the rock times the specific heat capacity times the temperature difference of the water coming out, uh, the temperature of the water coming out minus the temperature of the water going in. So the power we're going to get, so this was the heat, which is the energy. The power is the heat per unit volume. So it's just um, dividing the, the heat over time, but also it's heat per unit volume gained by the water times the volume flow rate is the other way we can calculate the, uh, the power in the system. So what, what does that mean? Well, the water velocity that we're interested in, this Vf for the fluid, it's going to be the volume flow rate of the water going through. Now that's, I'm gonna call it omega. And we'll come back to this in hydro schemes as well. And it's basically the volume flow rate divided by the area. So the velocity is just the volume flow rate divided by the area where um, that's the area of the aquifer for the water flowing through. And the power we've got flowing through that, well, it's the heat um, from the, the water flowing through. So that's the density of the water times the specific heat capacity times our temperature of the aquifer minus the temperature of the water going in. In this case, it's just times the volume flow rate omega. So the, the heat transfer, well, the, the way we're going to do this is we want to consider a small incremental movement in that, if, if I just go back, in this cold front. So what we're assuming is the cold water goes in and it's the velocity of removing all the heat out of the system. Now, it's an approximate way of doing it, but it also gives you a finite lifetime of the whole aquifer as well. And if this gets replenished, then you know, the lifetime is not appropriate, but it, it still gives you the way that you end up finding out how much energy is being extracted out of the system by the water that flows through. So here we're looking at the incremental change from the boundary between the cold to the hot water as that water flows through and we extract heat out of the system. So we also need to consider the porosity of the rock because that will determine how much water is uh, subtended by the flow rate going through. And the volume of the rock exposed to the, the water and the extraction of the heat is one minus the porosity times the area times this delta x incremental change. Now you see why we're doing this um, a little bit later on this slide. 
But this is a way that then we can look at the velocity of this by the incremental changes in distance as a function of time. And from that, we'll end up getting the, the power that we're interested in, in calculating. So please bear with me as, as we go through. So the heat removed from this rock element, well, the volume of rock exposed is just this one minus um, phi and the area times delta x. We'd shown in the previous page that the heat per unit volume rock element is um, the density of the rock times the specific heat capacity of the rock times temperature of the aquifer minus the temperature of the water going in. The volume flow element now is just this delta VR, so we put that in as well. And we also spoke about the volume of water passing through the element. Well, that's going to be omega, and this delta x change happens in a time delta t. So the volume of water passing through the element is just omega delta t. So the heat gained per unit volume of water. So in this case, it's what we had in the previous page of um, the density of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water, the temperature of the aquifer minus the temperature of the cold water going in, and then the volume uh, of water passing through the element, so omega delta t uh, as we got from here. Now, what we want is that the heat lost by the rock, we want to be equal to the heat gained by the water. So the water is extracting the heat out the rock and then taking it outside that we can use for practical purposes. But what we can do if we assume this and assume there's no losses in this process is we can equate these two um, equations. So now we've got the rock equals the water and you can see what we've got in here. So we've got a delta x and we've got a delta t. Well, dx by dt is just the velocity. So it's the movement of this cold water, hot water interface, and that basically tells us what volume is, is going through and we're extracting heat from. Um, and the heat removed from the rock element, of course, is just our Q um, MC delta T uh, divided by time. So here's our uh, velocity for extracting the heat out, just dx by dt. If we now rearrange this, so dx by dt means we're going to have this on the numerator and we're going to have this section on the denominator. So we just do that. We have um, the t1 minus t0 actually cancels out and we end up with the density of water times the specific heat capacity of water divided by one minus the porosity and then the density of the rock times the specific heat capacity of the rock the volume flow rate of the water divided by the area of the aquifer that we're extracting heat from. Now, in some textbooks, you'll see that this is given um, a, a variable lambda for, for all these parameters. And then it's spoken about as the, the velocity of the water moving through the, the aquifer. This is because it's easy to measure this velocity of the water that you're putting in and taking out it's harder to know uh, the speed and velocity of which you're extracting and, and moving cold interface to the, the hot water through the aquifer. Okay, so, so let's actually look at this and um, you know, how long will this system run? Well, basically what we've shown here is that this interface is slowly moving away as we extract all the heat out of the aquifer. So the cold water goes in, we extract hot water out and we're taking the heat out. And this is not being replenished in how we look at the system at present. So it's being depleted and there's a finite amount of time whereby this will come to the end of the aquifer. And then we cannot extract any more heat because the cold water going in is going to equal the hot water temperature coming out and there's no heat available. Well, the, the lifetime that we get it's just the length of the aquifer divided by the velocity of this interface between the cold to the hot that we showed in the previous slide. So if I take the velocity we've just calculated and divide the length by that velocity, we end up with one minus the porosity of the rock times the density of the rock times the specific heat capacity of the rock 
times the area of the aquifer times the length of the aquifer divided by the specific, uh, sorry, the density of water times the specific heat capacity of water times the volume flow rate of the water flowing through the aquifer. Now, I gave you uh, the definition of volume flow rate. <clears throat> Actually, normally in these systems, it's easier to measure the pressure of the water that you've got to push in to actually get a volume flow rate <clears throat> rather than the volume flow rate itself. And it's given by Darcy's law. So if you know you have to require, um, add a pressure delta P, then the volume flow rate you get from that is given by K, where K is the permeability of the rock times the area of the aquifer and the difference in pressure divided by the length of the aquifer. So this is how you use heat pump systems to generate pressure, to generate this delta P, it generates the volume flow rate, and that allows you to extract hot water out by putting cold water in at this volume flow rate. So this is how heat pump systems are run to extract water from the ground or extract water from aquifers or any other system. So the, the derivation we've done here also works for all heat pump systems that are used in many parts of the world and are much lower in CO2 emission um, because you're, you only have the pump electricity rather than um, burning gas to heat homes. Well, let's give an example. <clears throat> so here we've chosen an aquifer that is one kilometer long. It's 100 meters wide by 20 meters tall. So an area of 100 times 20 meters squared. We're just assuming it's rectangular to give some numbers. We're going to assume the water goes in at 20 degrees C and the aquifer temperature is 80 degrees C. We know that the density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. The specific heat capacity of water is 4180 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. The density of the rock is 2.3 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter and the specific heat capacity of the rock is a thousand joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So the porosity, we'll use a typical um, value for rock of 0.02. I'll talk a bit more about porosity in, in a moment. The permeability of a typical aquifer is typically K is two times 10 to the minus nine meters cubed per kilogram. So what we want to do as a question is work out what's the flow rate we need to extract a megawatt out of this. So a megawatt is what we might need to power a small village. So we just use our volume flow rate equals the power divided by specific heat of water, sorry, the density of water times specific heat of water times the, the T1 of the aquifer minus T0 of the cold water going in. The power here we want is a megawatt. So we have 10 to the six for a megawatt. Density of water is 1000. Specific heat capacity of water is 4180. And then here, um, we could use absolute temperatures in Kelvin, but since it's a minus sign, we add 273 to this side, 273 to this side, they subtract. So we can easily do 80 minus 20 to have 60 as the delta T here. And we end up with a volume flow rate of four times 10 to the minus three meters cubed per second. So that probably doesn't mean so much, but what's the lifetime of this system? <clears throat> well, we can use the lifetime and the equation that we had in the previous slide and derived there. So one minus our porosity and density of rock, specific heat capacity of rock, the area of the aquifer and the length of the aquifer, the density of water times specific heat capacity of water times the volume flow rate we've just calculated. We can put all these numbers in and we end up with 2.7 times 10 to the eight seconds. 
So for this example, and it's a relatively small aquifer, but it's the sort of thing you might use, as I said, for a small village for a megawatt, well, 2.7 times 10 to the eight seconds, it ends up only being eight and a half years. So you can see <clears throat> that there is a finite time in these, unless you are somewhere that there's a replenishment of the heat to reheat the aquifer as you extract heat out of it. Now, to give you an idea, you know, about 30 kilowatts is typically what a house continuously consumes. So if you had this for one house and you had 30 kilowatts in here rather than a megawatt, this system, if you don't replenish the, the heat, would last for 285 years. So you can see when you set this up for a single home that actually ground source heat pumps do have a lot of value and they will last a long period of time. So it's good for extracting small amounts of energy for homes or for small villages. For large cities, this gets much more problematic and it's much more difficult when you have a large number of uh, boreholes um, in very close proximity and especially on the same aquifer, ex all extracting heat from the same aquifer. So let's look at some examples. So in Italy, and the north of Italy, there's some very good examples um, in volcanic uh, and earthquake regions. So basically there's volcanoes, there's hot springs. This shows uh, Ladario in the north of Italy. The first geothermal power station was built there in 1911. And it was already generating 250 kilowatts by 1913. Presently, they have a much bigger power station. You can see the cooling towers. So it runs a Rankine cycle to generate electricity. This is the cooling towers for the Rankine cycle. And it generates 5,000 gigawatt hours per year. So that's, it's about 570 megawatt years. So it's a little bit less than a large coal fire or nuclear power station that you expect about a gigawatt year but it's still pretty substantial at 570 megawatts per year. Now, it's very low carbon electricity. There's, you know, the only carbon being released from all of this is really the maintenance, running the power station, the, um, the pumps, um, and any natural emissions that come out uh, from um, the volcano, typically in climate change is, is classified elsewhere. So this ends up being a lot less. Now here's another example, and this is uh, just south of Paris in France. And it is an example of, a, of 55 houses in a small village. And what they've done is knowing that there's an aquifer with an impermeable rock cover underneath the village, they've drilled a number of different wells spaced uh, different places with a central control. And this allows them to pump in cold water and extract hot water. They can then, uh, what they do is they have a loop that does that in the geothermal. They then have heat exchangers, sorry, the geothermal oop, heat exchangers that take that and take it to the houses. And then each house has a heat exchanger to go around an internal water loop that either has radiators or other forms of internal heating, such as underfloor heating. Now this uh, particular one, um, it's about 60 degrees C the water comes out for um, water going in. My apologies for this, but I actually have to take this phone call and I'm just gonna have to stop this briefly. I will 